Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the USMLE Preparation Companies Talking USMLE Podcast with Dr. Paul and Dr. Stavros. Hey so guys. today's episode is going to be, we're going to go back to the very beginning. We've been, we've been getting a lot of students asking, uh, myself and Dr. Stavros, about the very basics of Step 2 CS Prep. So most of our content, of course, is aimed at helping you navigate the exam from a strategic standpoint. How do you do this? How do you do that? How do you do this? How do you do that? But some students don't even understand the very basics of what to do on exam day, what to bring to the center, uh, what not to bring, um, how the exam structured, all of these little things. And so what this episode really is, it's a beginner's guide to step two CS prep. So before you even start your prep, you wanna really know what the USMLE lays out on their website as the things you need to know just in order to get started. So what we're gonna do is basically walk you through, we're gonna use the USMLE website's criteria as a starting point for talking about everything today, about our discussion points. Um, now, just so you don't have to sit there and take notes, we actually are gonna provide you with a downloadable um, document. So if you wanna download all of the notes from today's episode, go to www.step2csprep.com slash e, 16 e stands for episode but e 16 step 2 cs prep.com slash e 16 e 16 and you can download all the show notes so you'll have the bullet points basically everything we're talking about is from the us Emily's website but we'll just make it easier for you you don't have to go searching for it because you know there's a lot of information on the usmle.org website so if you just want to grab this make it a lot easier for yourself um, you can do so we even highlighted some of the most important things we're talking about today so yeah um, Dr. Stavros, you are, were working with uh, students recently, and this was brought to your attention, which is why we're talking about this. So let's get started here. Um, let's talk first and foremost about what to bring and what not to bring on exam day. Yeah. So you want to dive in and get started with that? Yeah. So basically on exam day, you know, many students, we're, we're training them, we're talking to them, and they have no idea. So, I mean, first things first is a scheduling permit. I mean, that's very important to bring. I've, I've heard some stories and some students tell me that they forgot the scheduling permit back home in Texas and they were in uh, Philadelphia and they missed their, their exam completely. Um, your confirmation notice. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, you know, obviously an ID that can't be expired, right? So unexpired ID, government ID, whether it be driver's license uh, or passport, that's very important. You know, you don't want to forget that while you're traveling East Coast to West Coast or driving two, three hours to a testing center. Um, and also one thing that really keeps coming up is stethoscope. I mean, bring your lab coat, white, bring your stethoscope. Now it's not required, but strongly recommended because they say that they have a limited supply to provide to students and doctors if they forget it. But I mean, why wouldn't you bring your own? Now, For sure. you can't have any digital stethoscopes, so those high def specific, you know, wonderful ones, simple stethoscope, because they'll actually tell you you cannot use it, mm -hmm. especially the ones, the cardiology ones, that you can listen to certain murmurs and tell you what it is. So that mm -hmm. is a big no-no. Mm -hmm. So lab coat and stethoscope, and you're good to go. That's what you're going to bring. Now, a lot of students, as we know, students oftentimes think way, way, way too detailed. And they'll say, I have a long coat, but I'm not really a doctor yet. So can I bring my long coat or do I have to buy a short coat? Do you, do you have any insight into that? Well, at the end of the day, um, everyone taking the step two CS exam, many of them are medical students. Others are physicians from all over the world. So sure. the SP does not know specifically who you are. You're walking right. in as a first year resident as the USMLE.org website specifically lists and states. So long, short, do not care. If you have any school emblems, anything on patches, they'll give you a nice white piece of paper, sticker, cover that up, and that's all it is, guys. You're going to walk in, see your 12 patients, and leave. Yeah. Simple stuff. Yeah, a lot of students ask me that, too, and I say the same thing. I mean, really, you have to remember, these are trained actors. They're not, look, they're not going to be, you know, looking you, uh, you know, head to toe and judging you based on the length of your coat. If you, but if you haven't shaved in weeks, if your hair's all over the place, yes. if you, you have stains on your pants and your, your white coat is you know brown because you've never washed it, these are yes. things that could uh, play against you. But the length of your coat, whether it's you know 
uh, six inches longer or shorter, it's irrelevant, guys. And like Dr. Stavro said, many people taking this are physicians in different countries, meaning they've earned the right to wear that long coat. So sure, don't think too far into it, right? Yeah. Now, um, a couple of things that, that, that we've experienced over the years is students will come to our center to train with us and they'll bring their luggage because they're coming right from the airport sure. or they'll bring their spouse or sometimes they've even brought their kids and the kids will just hang out. The spouse will hang out. Um, they'll, they'll ask where they can store their luggage. So a couple of things I want to point out right off the website here. Yeah. There are no waiting facilities for spouses, family, or friends. So you have to make sure that you do not bring them because if you do, they won't be welcome. They will be kicked out and it's going to be awkward for you. So make sure you just don't bring anybody. Just bring yourself. There's no need. You know, we're, we're all adults here. You don't need to bring a support system to the exam center. Um, and, and luggage, you, you absolutely cannot show up with luggage. It, it, first of all, it doesn't look good. It makes you look disorganized, but there's nowhere to put it. So you're going to be in trouble. And, you know, this is an expensive exam. The, the availability is very, very limited. Don't screw yourself over by, um, you know, overlooking the stuff that they tell you on the website you cannot do. Keep and that in mind. Yeah, and I'll tell you, Doc, uh, many things, and this has happened to a few of our students that have trained with us. Um, they, they didn't pass. They came to us to train. So that's why I know this. They said to me, Doc, had my test in Houston. I'm from Atlanta. And my flight, you know, I flew in the night before. It got delayed. I got in at one o'clock in the morning and I went to an exam day, tired and exhausted. So mm -hmm. what we tell our students is, you know, obviously if it's nearby, okay, fine. If it's a few hours away, get a hotel from the night before. If you have to fly to a destination, leave maybe a day or two days earlier because you don't want to have that happen to you where your test is coming up and you get in at three o'clock in the morning. I mean, that's not easy. To yeah. So he take, take that into consideration. Very yeah, important. I think it's always good to show up I mean, if your exam's on a Monday, show up on, on Saturday morning or Friday night, take a couple of days to get acclimated to the area, drive around, you know, um, let your body sort of um, recharge from wherever you came from, get used to the area and, and relax. Um, you know, like, like we, we know that this exam is around 1500 plus dollars. Yeah. It's like I said, availability is so limited. It makes no sense for you to try and squeeze it in you know, take a couple of days, spend a couple hundred bucks to stay at a nice hotel. So you're comfortable and you can sleep properly and just don't risk it. You know, these things are just, it's not worth it. And when you bring it up to acclimate, we'll talk about it later when we talk about scheduling. Remember guys, if you don't know, there's two types, morning and afternoon sessions. So if you're a morning person, try to get a morning session. And if you're yeah. afternoon, you get a morning, try to acclimate yourself weeks before, not the night before, because it's going to throw you off completely. You'll be exhausted and you won't do well because you are out of steam and out of energy. Be careful. Exactly. Exactly. Good. Um, one more, one last point here under what you can and cannot bring uh, actually two points. So one is you will be able to place personal items that you might need during breaks. So if you bring um, snacks or, you know, water, energy drinks, whatever, you can place that in a locker. Um, but it says you may not possess pens, cell phones, watches, pagers, personal PDAs. These are a little older. Uh, Two-way communication devices to so leave your walkie-talkies at home. Um, no, <laughs> notes, no notes or study materials. Um, and that includes during breaks. So, you know, during, I know during step one, during CK and during step three, a lot of students, not a good idea, but a lot of students will have notes in their locker yeah. and they'll go back and they'll do a quick review even though it doesn't really matter because I mean, if you know it or you don't at that point, but exactly. you can't do this during CS. So keep that in mind. Um, and what else there? You know, yeah. So you don't want to bring that stuff. They will provide you with, with pens, um, paper, as well as clipboards. Right. And then right. some students have asked us, is it click? Is it not click? I mean, I really can't say, but it's either going to be a pen that clicks or a pen that has a cap. And I think, well, if it's a clicky pen, Maybe they do that purposely because if you're in an encounter and you start getting nervous, you start clicking. So when we train like we do, Dr. Paul and I, we're always training nonstop. All these ideas come to us. So be prepared. They might give you a clicky pen and don't keep clicking because the SP will get angry, right? So always repeat that. And yeah, yeah. Don't click the pen. But, you know, if you're worried about the type of pen I think that they're going to give you, you're worrying about the wrong things. I agree with you. Ed. I agree. With you. This is one of those things where it's like, you're really, you're really digging into the weeds that, and it's really unimportant because who cares? Just don't click the pen. Don't tap the pen. You know, make sure you're conscious of any nervous habits you have, like the yes. pen 
um, shaking your leg when you're sitting there, you know, anything. You have to be very conscious of these habits because if you're doing them, it'll, it'll be obvious and it might rub the SP the wrong way and you could lose points. And, you know, when we have students here at our session live and sometimes live online, especially live because I can see them as a mm -hmm. patient, we see that on day one, right? We see like the nervous yep. tick, the, 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 you know, your hand is on your thigh and you're clicking. And then by day two, by day three, obviously we've eliminated that. So that's why it's good to kind of train live to kind of really see, well, am I going to really perform this way on exam day instead of being in my kitchen or living room in the dining room? So yeah, it's a big plus. You got to remember that always. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's move on to what to wear and when to arrive. What to wear. So just, just to make this point very, very clear, you can't wear any jewelry. So take out your earrings, take out your, um, your nose rings, um, no necklaces, the only thing, no watches. The only thing you can wear is a uh, wedding ring, engagement ring. That's it. That's it. Um, so the question I have for you, because students ask me this all the time, and I don't know that we've ever actually had this conversation. Um, it says wear comfortable professional clothing. Yeah. What is professional clothing? Now, I, I always tell students something. I'd like to hear what you have to say, and then I'll throw in my two cents. But it's a question I, I, I'm, I must have had asked dozens and dozens of times over the years. Well, what's professional clothing? So what do you think? What do you tell them? You know, and the reason why it's a popular question is many doctors, they wear scrubs. They're always in the ER, wherever mm -hmm. they might this might be. So I get that because one rotation you're wearing this, one rotation wearing that. I understand. But the way I look at it, the way I see it is every case you walk into is a new SP. So it's like you're walking into a sort of interview, meaning like you want to yeah. make sure that you, you impress them because that's the whole point. Looking good, feeling good, smelling good, you know, clean shaven if you're a man. So I would say if this was me taking the test, I'd wear nice slacks, nice shirt, tie, and my lab coat. Now, some students say, why tie? Yale and Harvard and Princeton, they, there are studies that show ties, you know, they transfer germs from one room to another. Okay, but it's exam day. So what if, let's say, you need to wear a tie because I think it's kind of like a residency interview because you want to look sharp, you want to look professional, and why not wear that tie for 12 cases and say, you know what, I wore my tie, I look good, and that's it. Women, you know, some, some, some uh, female physicians wear pants, shoes, always look professional. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I tell them. Slacks, a button-down shirt, um, and a tie. Um, obviously, when you're in the hospital, wearing a tie is kind of um, frowned upon because if you bend over and it touches a page, obviously. But this is a different scenario, like you said, so nothing to worry about. Now, something – go ahead. No, 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 please, please go ahead. Something very important, um, and this kind of ties in with something students ask us all the time, is, well, I don't want to go to this center because they are – um, not friendly to IMGs and I am, I'm an IMG. It says right on the website, if you have any identifying information on your white coat, such as your name, where you're from, your school, whatever, you will have it covered up. So it, it doesn't matter um, where you're from. They're not going to know. And, and we talked about this uh, in a video we shot the other day that plenty of people from the U S have accents. So yeah. just because you have an accent, Someone's not going to say, oh, you're from, you're from Africa or you're from this country or that country just because you have an accent. This is a USA. It's a melting pot. So don't assume that if you don't do well, it's because you're an IMG and they were, um, you know, targeting you. If you didn't do well and you failed, it's probably because you're not well prepared. It's not because they assumed you were an IMG and said, well, fail. Yeah. We've, I've dealt with thousands of IMGs in my day. I've been doing this since 2009. You have as well. Um, and we have an extremely high success rate with IMGs. Yeah. Typically the IMGs who reach out to us on Instagram, Facebook, uh, you know, and who call in, they say, you know, I'm an IMG. I failed. I think it's because I went to Philadelphia instead of Houston. Um, and that's why I failed because I'm an IMG and, you know, they targeted IMGs there. Uh, we have tons of students who go to Philadelphia, Houston, Atlanta, all over the place and yeah. they do well. Ultimately it comes down to, are you well prepared? That's what, that's it. So that was a long, um, long rant, but ultimately where you're from gets covered up. So don't worry about where you're from. Just worry about the quality of your presentation. Well, yeah, because we've had many students uh, recently from American medical schools who didn't sure. pass the first time. And they didn't pass because, of oh, God, yeah. ice, because of their cis, English, not so much, but because the ice and cis. And I even asked him, I said, well, you know, um, how did you feel on exam day? They go, well, I mean, we were, it was a mix of, of students and doctors from all over the world. I said, okay. So it wasn't like the specific yeah. thought of, 
this day is all American students and that day is all FMG IMGs. That doesn't exist, guys. So just yeah. please accept the fact that that does not exist. Yeah, you know, and if you're watching this or listening to this and you have failed and you're worried that you were targeted as an IMG, you have to realize that it was probably your presentation, your, your, your interview skills, the yeah. way you behaved, your demeanor, uh, something you did wasn't up to the quality and standards of the USMLE organization. Bottom line, you know, don't, don't feel like where you're from matters. Really, it's ultimately comes down to the quality of your preparation that will put you in a position to pass or to fail. And if you fail, then it's probably because your preparation, even if you prepared a lot, probably yeah. wasn't the right way. So keep that in mind. And one thing for everyone to remember out there is when you're in the room, you know, there's just you and the patient. There's somebody else. So there is a camera behind that mirror and that mirror and that camera is specifically there to audit the patient to make sure the SP is doing their job accordingly. Because, I yeah. mean, if it's only you and them and that SP is an actor, they're, they're getting, you know, obviously employed by the USM organization. They need to make the organization needs to make sure that the patient's doing their job. So. The, the patients won't not like you because of the, your name or because of your look. They have, they're doing their job. Simple as yeah. that. You have to Simple do your as that. That's position. So. Simple as that. Right. Yeah. Um, one last thing here. Um, it says hair, t hair accessories, neckties are subject to inspection. Um, so keep in mind that if you do wear something for your hair, you wear something or you wear a tie, they, um, they will look at it yeah. just to make sure that you don't have anything hidden there. So, Anything really that you're wearing, keep in, when you walk in, I want you to think, okay, anything that I possibly have on me is either, it is likely to be inspected. They're going to take a look at you just to make sure you're not cheating. So, you know, I would say take a minimalist approach to this exam, you know, take off. I would even take off my wedding ring. I would just take it all off. Why even risk anything? Right. Um, you know, and then just, if you need, if, you, if you're growing, you have long hair, tying it back, I think is not a bad thing. They'll inspect it, but keep in mind that they will. So just, it's good to be ready for these things. Right? And also watch out for perfume and cologne. If it's really, really strong, I wouldn't put either uh, just because there's, the, the patients might react accordingly because of that strong scent, which can yes. really can hurt you. So be careful guys. That's all we're saying. Yeah. You want to go in there with as neutral of, 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 a, of a smell as possible, you know, shower the morning of your exam or the night before, Make sure you shower, make sure you wash your hair, make sure you present yourself as best as possible because, you know, you only really get one chance. And, you know, I'll be very, very honest and, and candid here. If you don't have a habit of showering frequently, maybe you shower once a week, twice a week, and, you know, you just don't do it for whatever reason. If you walk into your exam and you're not smelling great, it can hurt you because if you walk in and you, you know, you're you have an offensive odor that's gonna hurt your score i'm sorry but if someone can't stand um the smell whether it's perfume cologne or just you haven't bathed and it sounds terrible but i'd rather say it and someone be pissed off that i even said it than not say it and have them go in and fail because they just didn't realize you, you want to go in as neutral smelling as possible and i'm sorry if anybody's offended by that it needs to be said because most people won't say that to you, but it's, I, I don't want you to fail for a stupid reason like that. Well, because we take things seriously, right? We make sure any, every student, whether we train them directly, indirectly, sure. um, we want the best because it is your future. So we take it to heart when we, we, whether, like I said, whether we touch you physically, like as far as training with you or indirectly training, seeing our videos, we care for everybody. That's all it is. And, you know, yeah. And you know, same thing goes with your breath. I mean, you're going to be close to someone keep, keep some, like some mouth spray or some mouthwash or something like a little travel size, something in your locker and just take a swish and spit it out when you go to the bathroom or, you know, um, a pop a mint real quick, just something to keep yourself fresh throughout the day. No garlic the night before, <laughs> please. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, and, and that's another important point. Like, you know, if you, dr if you go out for, um, you know, a dinner the night before and you eat garlic mashed potatoes, or you eat something with a very strong spice in it. Keep in mind that that will come out the next day. So yeah. Try to keep things as neutral as possible leading up to your exam, just so that you don't put yourself in any sort of precarious position that you don't want to put yourself in. Okay. Exactly. All right. Um, next, the next um, section is proper behavior. There's only one rule. Don't just, well, obviously act like an adult, but you can't discuss cases with your examinees, not during breaks, not afterwards. Okay. It's very important that you keep your mouth shut and you're not supposed to talk about the cases even after 
you've left the building. A lot of students do it and a lot of students actually go online and they'll ask for cases in forums or on Facebook. Don't get yourself in that situation because it's, it's an illegal uh, maneuver. It's, it's misconduct and it could cost you your exam. And you know what? I was reading the reason why the CS exam, the report scores, and we'll talk about it later again, the reason why it's not broken down into what cases you missed, what, case, what you did wrong, is to keep um, the, the, to keep the USM organization as far as to not compromise the CS examination. And that's mm -hmm. the whole reason why they don't break it down, because we keep saying to ourselves, why don't they break it down? The states, states around the organ on the website, we do that because we're trying they're trying to work on it to maybe release stuff in the near future but for now they don't tell you what you did wrong because they don't want to compromise the, the, the cases of the cs that's one yeah and you know at the end of the day um it, you know it's it's a tricky situation because if you failed ice you might not know what happened yeah you and me though we've been doing this for such a long time that i mean we have students we have probably 30 or 40 assessments come in a week right and within the first 10 minutes of an assessment, we know exactly why you failed. So we know if you failed or not. When someone comes in, I can tell right away, just based on their demeanor, whether they failed CIS or not. I can tell by the end of the interview if they failed ICE or not. And I can definitely tell after seeing one patient note, if they failed ICE, that the patient note was directly responsible for their ICE. So yeah. you may look at your results and you see, ISIS SEP, you see one line and, you know, 10 years ago, they gave you a little more detail, but you might see one line and say, and we, and you know, this as well as I do, students reach out every day saying, I failed ICE and I don't know why. That's why we've been pushing assessments mm -hmm. so aggressively because, you know, step one, NBME, step two, CK, NBMEs. You can see exactly where you're strong, where you're weak. There's nothing that the NBME or USMLE puts out that can, assess you for CS because you need to have some interaction and that interaction needs to be with someone who knows what they are doing and knows what to look for. Yeah. That's you and me. And that's why assessments are the cornerstone of our, of our company because we want students to make sure before they take their exam that number one, they're ready, but number two, that any weaknesses that could pose a threat are identified. So when we do assessments, we can tell right away. So it's important that even though you might get that feedback and you have no clue why, there are people out there, myself and Dr. Stavros, who know exactly why. And like I said, some students will do a three case assessment. Some will pay for a six case and do two back to back. One case is all we need to tell you. If, 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 if you did one case with almost 100% accuracy, accuracy every time, you and me, and we've talked about this, we can say you probably failed this. And, yeah. and, and, and unfortunately, we, you know, we, we go through periods where we give away free one case assessments. And we gave away, I think about 100 over the course of November, December, 2019. Yeah. And many students failed the assessments. And as a result, we recommended things like, you know, take the patient note program, um, come and do the live online, just work for, with us for a day to fix this one issue. And some students took us up on it, some didn't. Many students who didn't take us up on it ended up writing back and saying, hey, you know, I failed the ice. I don't know what went wrong. And what do we do? We go back and we look at your assessment and we were almost 100% across the board accurate. And so we would tell the students, you know, we told you what went wrong you need to fix it. So assessments are super important. I don't even remember what this top, what we were talking about, but we sort of went, got off on this little rant about assessments, but it's so important that you don't overlook assessments for the CS because you're doing them for everything else. Sure. Do them for the CS as well. Exactly. Just get it done. And won't be one step closer residency. That's all it is. Don't take out any fear, any doubt, just make sure you know what you're doing. That's all it is. Yeah. And, and you know, um, step one, students are always willing to, pay for programs to, to help them prep for step one, you have to be willing to invest for every exam. If you're not achieving the scores you want for the CK, don't be afraid to, you know, spend $2,000 to take Kaplan's course and, and, and go over the information. Same thing for step three, invest, do you world questions, get the books that are proven to help. There's courses I'm sure out there for step three as well. I'm not sure of, of which ones, but they're out there. Same thing for CS. If you're not achieving 
the, the, the uh, goals set out by the USMLE, don't be afraid to invest because if you invest $2,000, $2,500, let's say today, and you pass your CS on the first attempt, that gets you in a residency. Not only do you start making your money now, but you start making the six figures a lot sooner. Sure. If you fail CS because you didn't want to invest $2,000, you might not match next year or the year after. You might be foregoing five to $10 million of career earnings because one time you weren't willing to invest a little bit for some CS prep. So think about this. If I say to you, Dr. Stavros, give me $2,500 today and I'm guaranteeing you that you'll make five to 10 million over the course of the next 20 years. Of course you're gonna do it. And I'm not trying to sell anybody. I'm just saying, don't be afraid of investing in CS. Everyone's fast to throw money at step one programs. Don't be afraid to invest in CS too because although it's the quote unquote easier exam, if you fail the easier exam, it looks even worse. So keep that in mind. Yeah, right, and, and people, yeah. <laughs> It, it, and, and that's why people are listening and watching us we go on forever because there's so much to say. It really is with our content all over the all over the platforms, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. It really is all out there. We just wanted to make sure you guys understand the structure, the timeline, be guided the right way, and uh, move on to a better better future, right? In medicine. Exactly. All right. You want to dive into the exam format? So the exam format, you know, once you get in there and you, you give them all the information and your permits and whatnot, you have an orientation. Um, the patient encounter and the patient notes. The orientation, you watch a video, um, which is easily accessible, also usassembly.org. So I, we recommend just watch that, at least because you have to watch it again. Um, and then there's a little station where you can kind of acclimate yourself with the beds, with the instruments, because they can't expect you to walk in not knowing what it is. So you kind of get your hands and make sure that you know how to move the bed the right way, get acclimated. So when you go in on the first case, whatever the case might be, you're ready to go instead of saying, where is everything? I don't know where the sink is. I don't know where the, where the, the uh, autoscope is and whatever. So that's that. And then just so everyone understands the way the format is, it's 12 cases. Every three cases, there's a break. So whether it's in the morning or the afternoon, you have three cases. You have a 10-minute break. Three more cases. Then you have a lunch or dinner based upon when you start. Three cases break, three cases. All together, 12 cases, 15-minute breaks, 15 minutes it's two 10 minutes and one 30 minute for eating, lunch or dinner. So it's a pretty simple breakdown. Many people don't know that. So now you know, that's a good right. thing. So you wanna, you wanna expect the day to be around eight hours in length. Sure. We'll get 50 minutes total break, right? Yep. Like Dr. Stavro said, you get the 10 minute breaks after the third and then after the um, ninth encounter, you'll get the 10 minutes. Then you get the 30 minute break for lunch or dinner. Um, and they do provide both, correct? Correct. Still? Yeah. Um, you can bring your own food. Uh, they yeah. do have a fridge if it's required. Um, one thing to keep in mind is there's no smoking, no vaping in the, t at the, uh, CS center. Very important. And also I've had a few students that were diabetic and unfortunately they don't, um, cater to accommodate special meal requests. So if you're a vegan versus not, then they have, I think that they have regular sandwiches and they might have sandwiches without meat. That's the furthest they can do. But if, for example, some people that have special, special requests, unfortunately, you know, states online, they can't do that. So just be prepared, be ready. Yeah. Um, but there are certain restrictions and accommodations if you're pregnant, if you have any handicaps. I know because we had actually, we had two students in our course, a couple of, a couple, you know, they both were expecting and they were both six months pregnant. Um, great women. Um, and they called up and they contacted USMLE and they had some special requests where they were able to accommodate them with the timing and everything. So great for those out there who are pregnant, you got something. You got okay. to be something they have to do. Yeah. So um, before your first encounter, you're going to get a clipboard, mm -hmm. blank paper uh, for taking notes and a pen. Now, at the beginning of every encounter, there is an announcement. When you hear the announcement, what do they say? You may begin. At that point, you may begin. You'll also have, um, when there's five minutes left in your encounter, so after 10 minutes, a five minute warning, and then you will have a, um, a final announcement at the end of the encounter, at which point you have to leave, right? Correct, correct, correct. Now, something to keep in mind is that there are always a small number of non-scored patient encounters, just like with the, the other US assemblies. There's always questions that don't count, um, you know, they're t testing them out. They want to see, you know, if they are good enough to include in the overall um, exam. 
The thing is, we don't know which ones don't count. Students are always, they say, you know, I didn't do that good. Uh, how many don't count? Well, we don't know. It could be one, it could be three, who knows? But you have to go in there assuming every one counts and you have to make sure that you put forth the best possible encounter, whether you think it's a legit case or not, because you'll never know. So keep that in mind. Well, just like on step one in CK, you don't know which questions, which, which, which sections are uh, testing, right? Whether they're just beta testing. So you got to do well in all of them. As simple as that. Yeah. So um, if you do finish before the 15 minute um, indicator ends, before they say you have to leave, you can leave early. Something to keep in mind though, is that once you leave that room, you can't re-enter, right? If you do, it's considered misconduct. You will be penalized for that. Another thing to keep in mind <clears throat> is that, when that time runs out, you're expected to leave the room. Now, this is a really important point. Students will often say, do I just stand up and leave when I hear that I have to leave? Or do I say something like, what, how much can I say? Obviously, it's very, very weird to just stand up and walk out and stop saying anything. So yes. we always recommend students just wrap it up, you know, with, you know, three to five seconds, have something prepared in that case. Like, you know, I'm being paged, I have to leave, but I'll be in touch with you soon. Say something real quick and get out. If you say something and then you keep talking, that could be considered misconduct. So if you just keep it to a brief statement that you have in the back of your memory so that you can leave without seeming really odd, you know, it's just so weird to just stand up yeah. and walk out. Um, something real quick, like just like I said, I think that'll be okay. Um, you just don't want to extend what you're saying. You don't want to keep talking and talking and talking. Well, yeah, because every case is 25 minutes in length. So as soon as they say begin, the 25 minute timer has literally started. So when you, that's why when you leave the room earlier, that time is already put onto your patient note. But when it's, let's say you run out of time, you have to leave, like, like Dr. Paul mentioned, because if you continue to stay, don't forget, everybody else has already exited the room. Your patient has to grade you while you go type your notes. So that's going to mess up the whole cycle. So they're going to pull you out of that room, I guarantee. So stand up, like Dr. Paul said, say goodbye close it, leave, and start typing the note when you're outside. Right, so. good. Now, just some other additional information on the US Assembly website. Um, they say another exception is that you don't swab the standardized patient's throat. You don't swab them. Um, you shouldn't ever touch the eyes, like no, no reflexes. If you believe that you need to swab the throat or you need to examine the eye in a more intimate, detailed way, uh, write that in your workup, right? So you could do uh, throat culture, things like that. They may also have synthetic models, mannequins, or simulators to um, perform certain maneuvers, such as genital rectal exams. Um, you should have plenty of experience doing that on real patients based on your hospital uh, experience. If you are worried that you're going to see a mannequin and you're supposed to do a genital exam or rectal exam, and you don't know what, now don't keep this in mind, you're not gonna have to do a pap smear but you might have to uh, check for the prostate or you might have to check for masses in the vagina. These are yeah. things that you should have done over and over and over again. Hopefully you took the initiative in your clinicals to do these things. We don't, I don't I've never really heard of students actually saying they've encountered this. I don't know if you have. Um, Not really. But they say it's possible. They yeah. say it's possible. Um, one thing though that I, I have heard that there is a lot of is um, they'll give you an iPad with a picture on it like an x-ray, might be a broken bone, might be something, you know, enlarged heart. Um, so it's, it's important that you have the basic understanding of, of, of how to read an x-ray, a CT, an MRI. Don't get too worried that you're going to have something crazy. Think of things like a broken femur, right? A broken wrist. Very simple to identify things. Don't worry. You're not going to need to be uh, halfway to your radiology uh, certification. Just make sure you can read basic stuff. If you know your basic anatomy, you're going to notice something on what they show you. Yeah, because they won't, they won't give you information that's really going to give the case away. They're going to give you something that's probably sure. going to help you perhaps come up with a differential based upon the findings you already obtained from the patient themselves. Right. Um, they mentioned something in here. Um, it says, excluding the restricted physical exam maneuvers, meaning genital rectal exam, you should assume that you consent to do a physical exam on all standardized patients, unless you're explicitly told not to do so um, as part as part of the examining instructions, meaning if the doorway says don't do it, obviously don't do it. But it is true that it's assumed that you can do a physical exam, but you should always make sure you're getting permission. That's something to keep in mind. Just because you have consent doesn't mean you can just dive into it. Always ask permission to do something. Otherwise, you're going to get just killed with your CIS score, right? 
Yeah, and that's what we do when we train live. Um, we go step by step to know how to untie, tie the gown, how to maneuver the gown, what to do, what not to do. They are wearing their underwear, but you have to know how to approach it so you make them feel comfortable at all times or else your assist will go down. Exactly. Right, right. Um, next up, they talk about the patient note and, and specifically yeah. some of the problems that can happen. Now, we all know that we have to type the patient note and being able to type your patient note, that's, that's an entire additional training. We have lots of videos and in, in, in podcast episodes on that. Some of the things to keep in mind, though, is that you do have to type, but it is possible that there's technical difficulties on that day. If yeah. it happens, you need to be prepared to write. Now, if your handwriting is not legible, you, you probably, they're probably going to look at your note, not be able to read it and they'll fail you. So yeah. I would say, don't worry too much about this because it, it's very, very infrequent, but I would say practice writing out a couple notes and just make sure that if you have to write, you keep in mind that you need to be very, very legible. I would suggest you print rather than writing in cursive. If anyone even knows how to write in cursive anymore, yeah. uh, I don't know, but yeah. I would print be legible because if it's not, you're going to be in big, big trouble. Keep that in mind. And I think that's why they transitioned over to typing because you know, oh, uh, when I took the test, I wrote and I remember writing sideways, upside down, a couple <laughs> of stick figures. I'm like, I'm going to put it down and pray for the best. And that's, I did pass, but you know, I can only imagine those who are reading those notes. So that's why they did took you say, it. Was, did you say stick figures? Yeah. The DTRs. I put like a stick figure <laughs> and I said plus two here, plus one there. I was nice, all over nice. the board. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't um, know. Okay, good. Um, something they point out is if you have a case for which you think no diagnostic studies are necessary, which you don't always need diagnostic studies. If you have a very simple, uncomplicated headache, you don't need to do an MRI. And you know, it's 22 year old, there's no focal neural findings, it's clearly a migraine, maybe it's a cluster, who knows. Um, it's okay to put um, no studies are indicated, but make sure you don't just leave it blank, make sure you write no studies indicated. That way they know that you didn't just forget to do it. You actually purposely said no studies are indicated because they aren't in fact indicated. Yeah, and, and it's definitely a lot of questions because I mean, if I was a student, I'd feel, I'd feel the same way. I mean, we have them here and they go, Dr. Stavros, you know, but there's no, there's no diagnostic studies. And I said, okay, me and you know that because you're in front of me. But now if I send the note to Dr. Paul and he reads it and he hasn't, hasn't talked to you, he's gonna think of either you didn't know, you forgot, you ran out of time, He's not going to think, oh, yeah, she knows that or he knows that it's not necessary. And that's what I always remember that. There's a computer system, AI, there's a physician. You can't assume that they know you. They'll never meet you. You have to transit. You have to communicate through your note. That's the best thing to remember. Right. Never, never leave something up for uh, debate in someone's head. Never leave them wonder, think, having to make a decision based on their gut instinct. Always make it black and white, right? That no, 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 nothing required. If you leave it blank, like Dr. Stavros said, they might be thinking, well, everything else looks good. Maybe I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. But now that it's artificial intelligence grading your note, they might just see something blank and boop, points lost. So keep that in mind. All right. Um, so if you guys are joined, I uh, didn't listen to the very beginning, you can download the notes from this episode. Go to step2csprep.com slash E16. We're going to give you all the notes that we've going through, but we're also going to include two sample patient notes, gold, gold standard notes written by um, myself or Dr. Stavros that will show you what a great note looks like. So if you don't know what the show notes, you should at least um, opt in to get the gold standard patient notes. So you have a very good sample. Um, now, the last thing here is the calendar of test dates. Now, Dr. Stavros, you've been dealing with a lot of students one-on-one -on -one lately more so than me. And I know you're dealing with a lot of students who are, are struggling to get uh, test dates. Can you just riff a little bit about the whole issue with limited availability and, and your recommendations for students so they don't find themselves in a position where they need to write their test, but they can't get a date for eight months? Yeah. So it's been getting worse and worse because there's only five test centers in the country. We have Philadelphia, Atlanta, <coughs> Chicago, Houston, and LA. Um, 48 spots per day on average, sometimes less. There's it's limited space. So if, for example, today um, you, you, you try to register your exam and let's say it's in February, which we are in, you might be able to get availability by September, October. So realistically speaking, we've talked to medical schools, we've talked to students. 
Ideally, if you want to match, the match starts uh, the process mid-September. You want to have a date by May, June, the latest, which means I would recommend, we recommend to register December of the year before, even earlier, get in, register, pay the fee because spots are very, very limited. And if there's no spots available, because that's probably one of your questions now, well, usually have to be by the computer, family, friends, whoever's on the laptop checking nonstop for a date to open up because there are scheduling companies out there which the organization states not to use because you would have to give them your ID information. So you have to painfully look on nonstop on the laptop, on your desktop to look for spots available. So yeah. summarize, try to get early, talk to your medical schools, or whoever is sponsoring you for the exam and let them know you have to get in early. You don't want to wait till April of the year to try to get a date. You will not get a date. I guarantee that. If you do, yeah. it's very lucky and very slim to none. So yeah, that's pretty much everything you guys need to know. Um, we're going to leave some links in the show notes for you uh, if, you're, if you're listening to this uh, as a podcast. And don't forget to download the, uh, the show notes and the patient notes, uh, step2csprep.com slash E16. If you guys haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and click the subscribe button. That way you'll get alerted every time we release a new episode. And if you haven't downloaded our Step 2 CS prep guide, it's called the Step 2 CS Survival Guide for Med Students, go ahead. You can download the first four chapters absolutely free at drpaulusmle.com. Thank you guys all for stopping by. We hope that this was helpful, and we will see you on the next episode. See you guys.